Right, so I'll be talking about something that's um, loosely related to the other lectures, but not, not so closely related, which is um, uh, the Lindenberg exchange method. is a tool for getting some universality results. Um, it doesn't get you all the univers universality results that you'd like. Um, you often need to combine it with sort of a transverse method um, to get the best results. And we'll talk about that um, in a little bit. Um, so basically, the, the general uh, uh, principle of this method is uh, you know, if you have a bunch of independent amount of variables, um, and you're interested in, in some statistic of them, Maybe you're taking some, some combination of, of these random variables and then maybe taking the expectation of some, um, sorry, of, some uh, of some uh, function, it can be linear, nonlinear function of these random variables. Um, you want to understand what, the, what this expectation is. So what the uh, exchange method does is that it exchanges these random variables with, with a different set of random variables, which you, maybe you understand better. But they're, they're similar to, like, they may have the same mean invariance, or um, uh, so they, they're related to these, these, these original random variables, usually by some matching moments. So, for example, uh, their means might be the same. Okay, maybe the variance is the same. Um, and in the case of, of random matrix applications, we often need a few more matching moments than just the first two. Then. Often what you can do with the exchange method is that you can compare um, this statistic of, of, um, of, of this set of random variables with the same statistic of the other set of random variables. Uh, if, you have, uh, if you can check certain conditions. Um, and what that tells you is that this, this statistic is universal in that it, it, uh, uh, it doesn't depend on the precise distribution of each, each of these inputs as long as they're independent and as long as, as uh, um, you keep certain moments fixed. And um, so this gives you a certain type of universality. Uh, unfortunately, with a moment match matching condition, which is often not optimal by itself, um, so you have to combine that with, with other universality techniques to, to get uh, the best range of, of, of universality. OK, so this, this is sort of the, the general um, um, uh, description of the method. But maybe the, uh, the easiest way to, to explain the method uh, with an example is to talk about the most classical example by Lindenberg himself in the 20s. Um, when he proved the central limit theorem. OK, so you all know this theorem. Uh, so, sorry, there's something funny with this uh, earpiece. OK, <clears throat> so if you have ID random variables, they all have the same distribution x. I'm sorry, this, uh, I can't get this earpiece to stay on. OK. Um, if they all have, this, uh, let's say, a real random variables of uh, mean 0 and variance 1, OK, <coughs> and then you form uh, the sum, and you normalize by root n, um, then, as you all know, this converges in distribution to the, uh, the normal distribution. Okay? Um, so another way of saying that is that given any test, any test function, if you have a function f, which you can take to be smooth and compactly supported, uh, if you look at the statistic, if you look at this linear statistic, you take this smooth function um, of, this, uh, uh, of, this, of this average, uh, of this empirical average, you, you take the average, um, this will converge to the expectation of f of a Gaussian random variable, where g is just any random variable with the distribution of the standard Gaussian. Okay, this is an equivalent form of the central limit theorem. Um, so yeah, normally when you say conversion in distribution, you, you, you look at the, the probability that this, this is less than some threshold. That corresponds to taking f to be an indicator function, which isn't smooth, but you can approximate it by smooth functions. 
And because the Gaussian has a, has a smooth distribution, you can easily see that these, these are equivalent. Um, OK, so, so this, this is one formulation of the essential limit theorem. OK, so um, the way Lindenberg proves this theorem, um, so first of all, there's a technical remark. Um, is that, so there's a standard truncation argument. Um, so right now, our, our, our random variable only has two moments. Okay? It's, it's uh, mean is 0 and its variance is 1. Um, all the higher moments may be infinite. But without loss of generality, you can truncate and assume, for example, that the third moment is finite. Okay, so the, uh, this random variable could have heavy tails, but um, this statistic is very stable, um, and so you can apply truncation methods. If, you, if your random variable has, a, has, a, has, a, is heavy, has heavy tails, so for example, if the third moment is infinite, you can truncate it, replace it with a, a, a say, a bounded random variable plus an error which has, which has small variance, and the error will, will not contribute very much to this, uh, um, to, to this sum, just from, uh, I guess, um, um, Chebyshev's inequality. Um, and so it, it's very easy um, to truncate. It, does, it changes the mean invariance a little bit, but that also, you can show, doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, cause too much damage. But uh, there's a standard truncation argument, which is in the notes. I'm going to skip it. So you can assume without loss of generality that, that you have some finite moment here, which will become important uh, very shortly. OK, so um, normally the way that you prove this sort of thing, so the, the, the standard proof of the central limit theorem uh, proceeds by Fourier analysis. Um, Right, so you, 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 you write the statistic in terms of things like e to the i, the characteristic function. Right, so the textbook proof of the COT uh, represents this, uh, this sort of statistic in terms of the characteristic function. And the point is that, is that um, because the exponential of sum is sum of exponentials, this, this, fact, this factors, you know, this factors very nicely. And because of independence, Everything splits very nicely, and you can compute this, and and uh, and, and you, you just need to do a certain amount of Fourier analysis to uh, to get from from this back to the central limit theorem. Um, but this is a rather special technique. It works very well for the COT. It gives extremely uh, sharp results for the COT. But it relies very much on the fact that you're taking a linear statistic uh, if, um, in order to split up this exponential. If you had a nonlinear function here, this technique doesn't work nearly as well. Um, and it, the statistics that we are interested in random matrix theory are very nonlinear. So uh, we don't use this method uh, much in random matrix theory. Um, so um, yeah. So instead, what we do, yeah, so these random variables are not Gaussian. But what you do is that you introduce um, random variables that are Gaussian. Okay. So you introduce some new random variables that are also independent. Independent uh, and okay. So they're independent of each other. Uh, we can also assume they're independent of, of our original variables. Okay, so everybody's independent of everybody else. Um, and so these are new random variables, um, and they have the same mean invariance, of course. Okay, so they have mean 0, and they have variance 1, so they have the same first two moments as your original uh, random variable. Uh, the third moment may, may, may differ, of course. Uh, uh, Gaussians have third moment 0, uh, but, but your original random variables, we don't assume anything about the third moment. The third moment could be anything. Okay. So... Um, Okay, so the thing is that the central limit theorem is very easy to prove for Gaussians. Okay, so, um, all right, so we already know that if you take the empirical average of the Gauss, of, of Gaussian random variables, of course, some independent Gaussians is again a Gaussian. So you know, this is, in fact, e even just equal to exactly the right thing. Okay, so. For Gaussians, for Gaussian random variables, uh, we've already, the central limit theorem is just an, an algebraic calculation. Um, you know, um, and it's nothing more than the fact that, that some of independent Gaussians is Gaussian, and you just keep track of the mean invariance. So all you need to do, so all you need to do, all we need to do to finish the proof is show universality in the following sense. Okay, so. You need to show that um, that the, the, the statistic coming from the x's minus the statistic coming from, from the from, from the y's 
goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Okay, that, uh, that if you can show universality and that x and y can be exchanged with, with, with each other with, uh, at, at negligible cost to the statistic, so the statistic is universal, then you're done. Okay, because this, this guy was already the, uh, the right answer, so this would give you the essential limit here. Okay, so the, the thing about, about this formulation is that you, you, you no longer see the limiting um, distribution, I mean, um, G. Um, you only need to, to, to understand universality. Okay, so, um, all right. So the way Lindenberg proves this is by, um, by the exchange method. So you know, here you're swapping all the x's with all the y's, but rather than swap all n x's with all n y's, you can swap it, you can, you can split up this, um, you can decompose this big swap into n little swaps where in, um, in each swap you, you only uh, exchange uh, one variable at a time. So, um, so this left-hand side, let me call it star, has telescopes. You can write this big difference as a telescoping series, i equals, uh, I guess, uh, 1 to n minus 1. Uh, no, n. n of uh, uh, let's see. Uh, no, actually, it doesn't really matter, but um, I think. Uh, Take a partial swap like this, where i minus one of the x's have been switched, switched to, a, to a y, and you subtract off the same thing where i of the y of the x's have been switched to, to Okay, and so this is a telescoping series. It clearly sums to to this um, this big thing. Okay, so you, you're just flipping. Um, um, you, you just sort of. Um, Doing this swap sequentially one at a time and just keeping track of, of, um, of the delta of the, of the change as, uh, from, from, each, uh, uh, from, each, uh, from each change. Okay. So basically, the, the strategy is that you just try to understand um, these uh, small uh, differences as, as best you can, and then you just sum it up using the triangle inequality. Okay, so uh, just, just for uh, sake of explicitness, let, let's just deal with the, uh, uh, um, the final entry. Um, I can move the first one. Okay, let's, do the, uh, let's do the first one. So uh, y1 plus x2. Sorry, uh, sorry, x1. Let's just look at this one. Okay, so let's just look at the effect of uh, just swapping the first x1 to a y1 and keeping everything else the same. Okay, so the point now is, is that th these arguments are very close to each other. Okay, so that this is, uh, um, okay, so, um, you know, I mean, um, so the full average here could be quite different from the full average here. But, you know, these are all, well, they're almost bounded random variables. They have a third moment. Um, and so th this, this guy is, will typically be about di just distance one of a root n away from this guy here. So yeah, these, these are fairly close to each other. Um, and you're evaluating some nonlinear function f at two, two points that are close to each other. And uh, because of that, it's, it's, a, it's usually a good idea at this point to do some sort of Taylor approximation to try to compare these two. Um, so first of all, um, we, can, we can, so this is a big common term here. So let's call this um, s. Okay, so, so this is um, uh, s plus y1 over root n minus expectation of s plus x1 over root n. Okay. Uh, all right. So now what we do? Yeah, we just do a Taylor expansion. Okay. So let's, let's take the first term, for instance. Okay. So you can Taylor expand. This is this is uh, f of s s plus f of s, f prime of s, uh, plus we're assuming f, f is smooth, y1 over root n, plus expectation of, let's say, one half, double derivative of s, y1 squared over n, plus high order terms, but um, you can, um, so all the high order terms, so the, the third derivative of f is bounded, you get y1 cubed, but y and x we assume to have finite third, third moment, um, and then you've got a one over root n to, to now three powers. So if you think about it, the error term 
will be of size n three halves. Okay, so this is the, the main term is size one. There's a correction of size one over root n, a second correction of size one over n, and then all the errors uh, will be bounded by one over n over three halves because of this assumption of, of finite third moment. Um, and of course, the same thing is true for x. If you, so if you replace y by x, uh, everything, everything is the same. So it's just all the y ones by x ones. Okay, so this is, looks like a mess. Um, yeah, these don't look pleasant to compute, but actually we don't need to compute them. This is the beauty of, of, of the, um, um, of the uh, Lindenberg method. Um, see, this S is complicated. Well, it's not that complicated, but uh, it, it, this S is, is, some, is this combination of these random variables. But the point is that this, this S variable is independent of the X, of the X1 and Y1. Okay, X, so all the input random variables, X1 to Xn, Y1 to Yn are independent. So in particular X, so S, which depends only on the other random variables, doesn't depend, is independent of x1 and y1. So because of independence, this expectation splits like that, and this expectation also splits. Okay. So, so, yeah, so here's where we crucially use the independence assumption to, to split up the, um, uh, uh, these expectations. Now, these don't look fun to compute. Uh, in fact, you basically need a CLT to, to compute them, which we are trying to prove. But um, we don't need to compute them. Because um, we, we now observe that if you replace the y's, uh, if, if you replace y1 with x1, whatever these, these quantities are, they don't change. Okay, so because uh, th well, th there's no y1 here anyway. If you replace y1 with x1, because the moments match, and x, x1 and y1 have the same moment, first moment, um, this, uh, um, this expression is the same. And uh, again, similarly here, when you change, exchange y, y, x1 to y1 here, this expression doesn't change. So when you take the difference, all these terms cancel. You don't actually need to compute them. And so what, what you find so t is, is that this difference, therefore, this whole difference is just nothing more than one over n to three halves. It just has size n to three halves. Okay, and you're summing n of these terms, and then you're done. Okay, so, so what you find, in fact, if we get a more quantitative theorem of various scene type, that in fact, the difference between these two uh, statistics is actually one over root n. Okay, because every individual switch, uh, by doing this Taylor expansion, uh, has an error of three halves, and you're doing n of these swaps. Okay? And so the, uh, um, the decay rate that you're getting is, is good enough that you, that you get a good bound here. Okay. Um, so this explains, for, for instance, why it's important to have exactly two conditions in the central limit theorem. So you, you can think of the central limit theorem really as, as uh, so, so, so under this interpretation, you can think of the central limit theorem as, as what you might call a two-moment theorem. What it's really saying is that the first two moments of your random variable are all that are needed to, to determine the asymptotic behavior of your statistic. That if you, if you have different random variables with the same first two moments, um, then asymptotically um, uh, your, your statistics match. If you, if you only had one matching moment, then this wouldn't work. Okay? If you had one matching moment, you, you can't afford to Taylor expand up to this order because you, you can't control this term here. You can only expand to first order, and then your error term here would be one over n, <coughs> And then when you add up n, um, uh, your, your n terms, you now get a, a difference which is bound bigger of one rather than little of one. Um, and of course, the central, thing, you know, central limit thing is not true if you change the variance. Okay? If the variance is not one, you don't converge to the, the variance one Gaussian. Um, you know, so the two moments are absolutely necessary for COT, and this argument um, shows you why. Um, this argument also shows you that, that if you had more matching moments, so, so if, if, you're, if, for example, um, your random variable had the same um, match also third moments with the Gaussian. In other words, it, it, uh, it was not skewed. The third moment was zero. Um, this argument would show that, in fact, you get a better convergence rate. Okay, so if you had three, mo three matching moments, you could expand the Taylor expansion one more time. Your error term would upgrade from one over n to three halves here to, to one over n squared. And then your total error in your final central limit theorem would upgrade from one over root n to, to one over n. Okay, so the more moments you have matching, um, the better the error term you would get for um, uh, for at least for this formulation of, of the COT. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, when you go back to, to the standard formulation of COT, the error term actually degrades back to, to one, of the, one of the root n. But um, at least for this uh, sort of smoothed out version, uh, you get better decay. You can also see that from the Fourier method too, actually. But um, OK, so this is the basic principle behind the, uh, the Lindenberg method. Um, and the, the, the beauty of this method is that um, you know, it, it didn't rely so much on the fact that this was a linear statistic. Um, I mean, it did it just a little bit, um, but um, it, it is much more robust to, to having a nonlinear behavior uh, of, of, um, 
with respect to the x's, then the, the, the Fourier method. So by the way, uh, people who know about Stein's method may see, that, may think that may, may see a lot of similarity. Um, Stein's method is also another method for, for, for proving things like central limit theorem. It is, it is very similar. Um, although Stein's method is, is much more focused towards proving that things converge to Gaussians um, rather than proving universality. Um, and, and Lindenberg's method um, works even if the limit, it, um, even if the limit distribution is not Gaussian, um, and which is often the case in, uh, in, in nanometric sphere. It's, uh, um, I mean, you can also, the science method has some, some application in nanometric sphere too, but I won't talk about that. Here. All right. Um, okay. So, right. So, so basically, um, the general principle is, is that if you have a statistic involving n functions, uh, n random variables, normally there's a normalization factor of 1 over root n, which means that every time you do Taylor expansion, you, um, every term improves by a factor of 1 over root n. And if you're doing n swaps, you, uh, you need a, an error. Uh, each swap should have an error of like 1 over uh, n to the 3 halves, and that, that's why you need two matching moments. Um, in random matrix theory, you don't have n random variables. You have like n squared. Um, or either n squared or, or n choose 2 or something like that. Okay? But, but the number of random, independent random variables is now n squared. And if you want to swap one random matrix of another, you need to make n, about n squared swaps rather than, than n swaps, which means that if you want to use this method, the, the error for each swap should actually now be of order n to the minus 5 halves rather than n to the minus 3 halves in order, order to, to get little of 1 when you multiply by, when you do all n squared steps. So normally, um, when you go to random matrix theory, uh, all these two-moment theorems become four-moment theorems. Um, you, would, you actually start needing four matching moments in order to, uh, to make this argument work. Okay. So um, let me give you a, a simple example of, of this. Well, it's not that simple, but, uh, but one, one of the simple examples of Lindenberg's method applied in random matrix theory. So uh, let's take uh, a real vector matrix. Okay, so these are real random variables. Okay, you can also handle complex. Yes, the notation just becomes a little bit messier. So let's, let's take real. Um, they're, in, they're independent. Um, let's even say I, IID. Well, let's say independent for um, on the upper diagonal. Um, and they're all normalized to a mean 0 and variance 1. Uh, except, okay, well, I keep going. Um, it's going to be convenient to, uh, you know, on the diagonal, actually, it's convenient to normalize the variance to be 2. Okay, so we're going to have a, a random matrix of variance 2 on the diagonal and, and, and 1 outside the diagonal. So it's not so important, this 2. Um, the only reason I have this 2 is because uh, one of the most important examples of the real big ensembles are, are the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, GOE. And uh, this is the case where the off diagonal. Uh, Entries have they have uh, our Gaussian invariance one, and the, the, the diagonal entries are Gaussian invariance two. Now this turns out to be the correct uh, uh, normalization if you want to make this ensemble um, uh, orthogonally invariant. That's the O in the GOE. Okay, so so this of course is is is, is, a, is a the basic example. Or you could take, um, an, but there are many many other ensembles of this type. You could take um, sign matrices where. All the off-diagonal entries are plus or minus one. You, you impose symmetry, and you impose that the diagonal is plus or minus root two. Okay, so so these are real vector matrices, and so the um, claim I want to make okay, so what we're going to do for this matrix: uh, first of all, we normalize it, one root n. Um, and then we're going to look at the Stilch's transform. Um, so, uh, okay, so we, 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 we pick some, some uh, spectral parameter, um, z, and z will be in the upper half plane, so like this, okay, sitting above some energy, and then separation uh, eta. Uh, we're going to look at the Stilch's transform. Uh, which is that you take the resolvent, or Green's function if you like, uh, take the trace, take a normalized trace. Um, so I, I think in earlier lectures, uh, this was called M of, uh, M of Z. Uh, I, I like calling it S of Z. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, you, you can call it M if you like. Um, OK, so uh, this is the Stilch's transform. Um, so this, as we saw in earlier lectures, this is a, this is a very important uh, statistic. Um, it governed a lot of the uh, uh, um, 
local, it covers both sort of the bulk behavior and also the microscopic behavior of your, of your spectrum, depending on, on and, and the ADA sort of determines what, what scale or spectrum you can actually see using this, uh, this, uh, um, uh, this approach. And so, um, okay, uh, so what should I do? Yeah, so uh, what we're going to prove, uh, let me see exactly. All right. Yeah. So if you have two and if you have two m n and if you have two um, Wigner matrices, um, okay. So uh, uh, so let's, let's just assume just two matching moments uh, to begin with, and nothing else. Um, there's there's also some technical um, tail conditions. Um, um, we're gonna see, we, we we need these. Um, um, these random variables to decay fast enough. So we're kind of, uh, being sub-Gaussian, quickly enough. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me not dwell on exactly what you need. Okay. But, but think of your, your random variables, C is either being Gaussian or, bound, or bounded. Um, okay, so, so, we, so like all moments, uh, all moments are, are bounded in particular. Okay, and then um, if eight is big enough, for example, if eight is bigger than, uh, what, is, what is what I needed here? Uh, let's say uh, n minus one half. Okay, so if, if, you, if you are sufficiently far away from the spectrum, uh, then you have universality. Uh, okay, let me call this S of uh, MN. Okay, that, uh, that, that you take this particular statistic, the expected filters transform of um, uh, of a matrix, which is very roughly speaking, is trying to count how many eigenvalues. Uh, it, it, it's not exactly this, but it's, it's roughly counting how many eigenvalues there are uh, between e minus eta and e plus eta. It, it's, it's not quite that, but that's sort of roughly what uh, what it's doing. Um, and so this statistic is universal. You can swap m with, with, with m n prime, and you get the same uh, answer as long as you are uh, you, you are not at very small scales. Um, so you, you you stay at n minus one half. Now this this is not optim This is not really satisfactory because uh, if you want really local behavior, the, the, um, with this normalization, the uh, the um, the average um, the, the the microscopic scale is actually one over n, and so this is quite far from that. Uh, so you only get um, uh, you only get so halfway between the, the bulk scale of one and the micro scale of one over n with the theorem. Okay. But um, the thing I wanted to add. But if um, if you assume four matching moments, okay. So what that means is that um, is that not only not only do the means of variances are fixed like this, but but um, the third moment's degree and the fourth moment's degree. If, if, if these moments agree, then um, then this works. Okay, so then then one can take eta all the way to n to the minus one. In fact, and you can even go just a tiny bit below n to the minus one. In fact, you can you can actually um, penetrate just a little bit below the uh, the uh, uh, the um, scale. In fact, the, the argument I give is minus thirteen twelfths, um, and um, uh, and and uh, okay, and you still get universality. Okay, so so even at the micro scale, you still get universality, but you need these extra match matching moments. Okay, if you only have two matching moments, you can only get down to uh, to this scale. Uh, if you have three matching moments, uh, by the way, you, you get down to n to the minus one plus epsilon. You, you you almost get down to the, the the micro scale, but not quite. Okay. So. Okay. So basically. The, the, the way you, you, you do this, it's, it's almost the same proof as for the central limit theorem. Um, so th let me call this, uh, this thing a name. So, so this, this, this uh, sorry, not the trace, uh, but the inverse. Okay. Uh, actually, no, before I do that, no, let me not do that. Um, so the, uh, yeah, so you, ha you have these two uh, Richter matrices, MN and MN prime. Okay. 
And so they're all diff they're completely different from each other. So, um, you know, so you have to swap n squared entries here. Uh, you have to swap all n squared entries of this matrix in order to get this matrix. But you can you can break up this swap. You know, so to, so to get from your one matrix to the other, um, you can break it up into I think uh, uh, n plus one over two different swaps can be decomposed. Uh, now, you, you can't just swap the entries one by one because you have to maintain symmetry. So um, if you're on the diagonal, you, you just swap the diagonal. That's not a problem. But, but uh, if you want to swap, I say, um, this entry with the corresponding entry over here, you have to also swap the, the opposite entry over here to maintain uh, symmetry. Um, so writing down exactly what the swaps are requires a not notation. But, but basically, uh, what you end up... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, um, a, a single swap... Something like this. So, so, so um, 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 you can break this this big swap into a bunch of little swaps, and, and each, what each little swap looks like is that you there'll be some intermediate matrix M and tilde, which some of the entries will be zij and some of the entries will be zij prime, and there'll be one entry which is zero, and then the opposite entry is also zero. So there'll be a matrix, matrix almost Wigner, except that one entry is, has been zeroed out. So it's essentially a Wigner matrix. Um, you might call it a generalized Wigner matrix. So you. Uh, you, you have this, sort of this generalized Wigner matrix here with, with a zero, uh, and Eij is a modified elementary matrix. It's, it's a matrix of a, of a one in the position which is zero here, and also one in the opposite position, okay, and zero everywhere else. So it's just a sort of rank two matrix here. Um, okay. And if, if Ij is diagonal, you do something slightly different. But, uh, but in, um, if you're off diagonal, uh, you do something like this. Okay, so... Um, yeah, so if, if you add Zij times Eij to this matrix, you just repla you, you're, you're replacing the zero entry with Zij, and if you instead add Zij prime, you, you replace the zero with the Zij prime. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to write down exactly the precise definition of these things. Hopefully, it's sort of clear what, what, what I mean by this. But, um, but basically, this, this difference here, so the upshot is that you can write this difference as the sum. Oh, let me call that theta star. So star is the sum of about n squared terms, expressions, to form expected value of the Stokes transform of uh, mn tilde plus um, zij over uh, times this elementary matrix minus the expected transform of uh, the, the other guy. Um, and so basically, if you can show that if, if, if each of these terms, if you can show that each of these terms is little o, is, is better than one over n squared, smaller than one over n squared, 